helping me to develop this this um, this theme because there is a lot of conceptions around this uh, topic. There is a lot of things that are misunderstood, especially when the word reformation is involved. So I want to I want to ask you from the outset to to bear with me as we develop this and we try to bring this to a biblical context and to understand where do these five solas of the Reformation play in our Christian life. But before I go any further, I want to remind you of the duty you have to examine everything you hear in the light of the Scriptures. Remember that the Scriptures are the standard and everything Every teaching that we hear must be brought to the authority of Scripture and be measured by the grid of Scripture. It doesn't matter who is teaching. It doesn't matter who is speaking. The name of the person, what matters is whether if it is biblical. Let, let us always train our minds to think in such a way and always ask ourselves a question. Is this in the Bible? Is this in context? Is this biblical? So, I do exhort you to, ex uh, to exercise discernment as we go about learning about this uh, theme. So, we remember that there was a period of darkness that had enveloped the church. And that period stems from 451 A.D. and 517 A.D excuse me, 1517 A.D. Now this period is recognized in church history as the Dark Ages. And as you may remember when we study the Protestant Reformation, this period started in 451 in the Council of Chalcedon. We remember that Chalcedon dealt with the two natures of Christ. Now we remember that in 325 A.D., the previous council, which is known as the Council of Nicaea, dealt with the identity of Christ. And the question was, was he God or not? Remember that very early in the church, we had several heresies arousing where, for one side, Sibelius challenged the the, the the nature of Christ, whether he was a creature, he called him a creature, a creation, and later areas of Alexandria also challenged the deity of Christ. So there was the Council of Nicaea that dealt with this issue, and it was affirmed from Scripture that Christ was homo usias. That means he was of the same essence with the Father that in the Godhead were three persons, one God. We are monotheists, although that we are monotheists, we worship one God, but that God in the Godhead is three persons in one. And that is known to us as the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, as a consequence of Nicaea, we see that there is a gap and between this period of time, there's another controversy that began to arouse. One of these controversies is what is known as the Monophysite controversy, the Monophysites. The Monophysites, in essence, said this, that Christ no longer had two natures. That after he raised from the dead, after he was risen, he was only deity. Now, this arose all kinds of problems, all kinds of theological problems. We don't have time to go through those, but in essence, that was the controversy. Was Christ uh, God alone, or was he God and human? And if he was human, to what extent was he human, or to what extent was he God? To what extent did his humanity trunk his divinity, or vice versa? So this was the, uh, if you will, the, the before set uh, 
before the Council of Chalcedon. So in Chalcedon, finally, this issue is addressed, and this is the main reason for the council. Now, the champion of Chalcedon was the bishop of Rome. His name was Leo. He's known as Leos Magnus. Now, Leos Magnus, as we remember when we pastored here, when we did our survey in the church history, he was the champion for Chalcedonian uh, Christology. That is, his tome, tome, T-O-M-E, the tome of Leo. And his tome was the basic document to affirm the two natures of Christ. The phrases were coined like this. Christ was and is vera homo, that means truly man, and vera dei, truly God. Not 100% man, not 100% God, no. He is fully man, fully God. That was the language. And the man who championed this was uh, Leo Magnus. But Leo, in his tome, inserted an appendix. And he said this, the bishop of Rome is the vicar of Christ. He is the successor of Peter. So within that sound uh, Christology, he inserted his tome. And, and within his tome, he inserted that doctrine of the bishop of Rome having supremacy over the other bishops. Hence was bir uh, birth the doctrine or the office of the Pope. Now, remember, the word Pope comes from the Greek papas and only means a father. And that term was interchangeable with the term bishop or overseer. So, this is the beginning of what is known in church history as the demise of empirical Rome. We remember this from the last time we saw church history. And it begins what is known in church history as ecclesiastical Rome. Why? Because by the providence of God, in this time also, the Roman Empire began to demise. And uh, raiders from n the north, the, 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 the northern tribes like the Gauls, the German tribes, the Gauls began to invade Rome. So by 455 A.D., uh, Adela the Hunt came to Rome and he was persuaded by Leo to leave Rome. He had invaded and conquered, but he was persuaded by Leo, the bishop of Rome, to leave Rome and not to destroy it, although he, he plundered Rome. So the people began to see the... the uh, the ecclesiastical authority as the backbone of society. So Rome begins to gain political power. So the office of the Pope begins to be looked upon as the power of, of God on earth. So the question begins to be placed up there, uh, who will crown the next emperor? So this is just a, as a way of understanding what's happening in this period of time. So this period then marks the beginning of the Dark Ages. Now, the other side of this, we come to 1517, and we uh, historians, I say we, but historians, uh, mark this, 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 uh, this date because it's a year in which Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses in the castle door of the chapel in the city of Wittenberg. All right, that was a October 31st, uh, 1517. Why is that important? It's because we remember that Luther nailed his thesis as a protestation for the abuse of indulgences. Remember, we talked about this the last time. He wasn't trying to split the church. This was not a protest against all the doctrines of the church, neither was he claiming salvation by God's grace through faith alone. He wasn't doing that, although many Christians believe that that was, that was the purpose of Luther. But Luther was protesting because we remember that he was the pastor also of the city of Wittenberg. Uh, 
And we remember that he began to see that less and less people began to show up to the services. And he began to be concerned. So legend has it that Luther is walking by in, uh, in the town. And he finds one of his uh, parishioners dead drunk. And Luther raised his voice and t- tells to this man, I will see you on Sunday in confession. And to this, the man replies and said, Father Martin, I don't need to go to confession because I'm going to heaven. And Luther asks, what do you mean by that? And he pops his letter of indulgence he had purchased in the city of Judenburg River. And Luther reads this, and he realizes that this, is, uh, this document is a plenitory indulgence. That means is if you come across this, if you were able to avail yourself of this, that meant that you were exempt from doing penance, from confession, and were exempt from the fires of purgatory. It was like cutting, sort of cutting to the red tape and going straight to heaven. So, so th- this, this was the audacious claims that some of the uh, sellers of indulgence were given to the people. Right? We remember this, that uh, this Luther was appalled. He was really distressed because he saw this as an abuse of indulgences. Right? And we remember that the indulgences were somewhat the vehicle that the Pope was using to build St. Peter's Basilica. So the Pope had ordered these indulgences to be sold in Germany with the help of the prince of the region of Saxony, uh, excuse me, um, the prince of Brandenburg, Albert of Brandenburg, was in cahoots with the Pope, and both of them have, you know, come to this agreement that they were going to be selling these indulgences. So this is more or less the political reasons why Luther posted his 95 theses. Now these 95 theses were if you will, the straw that broke the, ca- the camel's back. We saw that in the past, there, w- there had been other voices that had been, uh, if you will, quiet down or, or shush or shut down, like, for example, John Huss. We remember John Huss in the 1300s who spoke against the uh, doctrines of the Catholic Church and how many of the traditions were not from Scripture. Huss, um, excuse me, um, did I say John Huss? Yeah. yeah. Huss was uh, indicted by the church and then in four, uh, 1415 was burned at the stake. Previous to him, we have John Wycliffe who wanted to translate the Bible into the English language for the common people also who had been uh, persecuted by the church. He was a professor of theology in the University of Oxford in England. Right. So these things are... What, it, um, what gives way to, to the Reformation. These this are the political and the religious circumstances that bring us to 1517, where then Martin Luther nails his thesis as a protestation. Now, these theses bring Luther into a series of debates. Debates begin to shape Luther's theology. We remember this, these are known as the Heidelberg dis- disputations. Now, it is in this that we see that the uh, theology of Luther begins to be challenged, and Luther begins to inquire into the church traditions and documents, and he begins to see that there is an inconsistency in the church. And he, the only solid ground, as he said, that he found was the Bible. So, it is during the 16th century that the Protestant reformers, in the light of all these things, they sought to go back to the church roots. Now, this is very important because this is very important for us to understand because we must understand that what the reformers try to do, they compare the doctrines of the church, they began to see that many of these doctrines were not found in scripture, but were rather traditions of men. So they 
they sought to go back. And the question what was asked, what is then the source of the faith? Where, where do we get the source of the faith? Where, what is it? So, this meant for the reformers, the apostolic faith. That is, the teachings of the apostles. Now, we remember, we talked about this since very early in the church. It was considered the teachings of the apostles, just in passing through here in two sections. The, there was what it was known as the charigma. The charigma comes from the Greek. It means the proclamation of the apostles. That is, the gospel that the apostles preach. That's the charigma. And then you have on the other side the didache. Now the didache comes from the Greek. The dokimaxo, it means the teachings, the doctrines. So, the reformers sought to go back to that apostolic faith. And the only source that they found for this faith was Scripture. Now, it is in an effort to go back to the original faith that the reformers coined five theological points. Now, Coming from the Protestant Reformation, these points are best known as the five solas of the Reformation. Now, I will begin by first explaining what these five points are not. Okay? These five, these five points are not the ideas or philosophies of any man None the reformers, nor the reformers invented any of these five points. It wasn't Martin Luther, it wasn't John Calvin, or John Knox, or Theodore Betza, or William, uh, or, or William Farrell. None of them invented the five solas. And why do I make this distinction? Is because you see, uh, sadly, but today, people will drop that accusation upon anything that has the word refor reform or reformation on it. They said, well, that was invented during the 16th century. Okay? So that is not true. And I want to make that distinction be be before we go any further. That is not what the five solas are. Okay? They are not the inventions of any man, neither are the philosophies of any man being imposed into Scripture. No, it's none of that. Now, the five solas of the Reformation are, listen, are a collection of the five central themes found in the Bible. The five solas of the Reformation are a collection of the five central themes found in the Bible. As the Reformers went back to the light of the Scripture, listen very carefully, that's, that's very important, as the reformers went back to the light of Scripture, they began to realize that there is five areas, and this ha these areas had been obscured by traditional traditions of man and the Pope's decrees. Now, it is in order to protect, now it's in order to protect doctrine and the purity of the Scripture that the magisterial reformers sought to surmise these five overarching themes. Now, these themes are found in scriptures. Now, they coin, in order to, to surmise this, they coin five Latin phrases. Now, it is important to place these phrases, it is, okay, it is important for us to place these five phrases in the correct order. First of all, okay? Why? Because they built one on top of the other. Okay, so the first, the first phrase is this. Can you guess it? 
sola escritura. Sola escritura. All right, it looks like an A, right? There you go. You see, that is accountability. Sola Scriptura. Now, this is in direct opposition to the authority of the Pope and the traditions and the councils. Only Scripture, listen, only Scripture can bind the conscience of men. Now, this is what Luther said when he was debating with the Catholic theologians. Because this is what it came down to. The Catholic theologians like Thomas Cajetan, for example, maneuvered Luther to a position when he placed this question before him. He said this, Brother Luther, do you realize that what you are saying is in direct, in direct opposition to the church councils? Do you realize that? That you are opposing the magisterium of the church, the whole body of the church, the holy, the holy ecumenical and theological body of the church is against you. Do you realize that? And Luther said, well, maybe the councils are wrong. And to this, the, 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 the council, to this, the, the Cajetan, who was the most, one of the three more prominent Catholic theologians of the time, said, what? you telling me that the church is wrong? How arrogant can you be? And he said, the scripture contradicts the councils. So if I must choose between the councils and what the council said in scripture, I stand in scripture alone. Later, when he was debating uh, John Eck, Eck cornered, he cornered Luther in the same position. But as a cork of one of those corks in history, Eck means corner. And he cornered Luther and he said, Brother Martin, do you realize that that is exactly what Huss said? Huss had been previously burned at the stake as a heretic, allegedly, because he thought the same that the scriptures alone had the authority to bind the conscience of men. So they, this was a battle for authority. So Egg said to Luther, Brother Martin, the Pope is against you, the Popes in history are against you, and the church councils are against you. And Luther said, where church councils and the Popes contradict the scripture, he said, I stand in scripture alone. Because he didn't find any other solid ground. But you got to understand that Luther was hammered into this position. Like Karl Barth said, when Luther nailed his 95 thesis in the castle door, Luther had no idea of the storm that he was brewing. He compares Luther to a man, to a blind man, uh, going up the stairs to the church steeple who loses his footing and in his struggle to try to grab a hold of something to hold him and prevent him from falling, he grabs the bell of the church, the rope that holds the bell, and he ends up waking up everybody in the middle of the night. You know, that's, what, that's what Karl Barth said of Luther. Luther had no idea of the amount of trouble that these 95 articles were going to bring to his door. Now this started because Luther, by his 95 articles, we remember when we started this, right? One of the theses says this, if the Pope has the power to enter purgatory, why doesn't he enter purgatory by the mere sheer love of the Christian faith and stop charging for it. Right? That was one of the theses. But you got to understand that Luther in his naivete 
thought that the Pope was ignorant of what these people were doing. Because in another thesis he says, if the Pope knew what these rogues are doing, he will halt the selling of indulgences instead of building St. Peter's Basilica over the bones and souls of the people. But not knowing that the Pope was the instigator of these indulgences. So, the question is placed before him. Brother Luther, so are you against the church? Are you against the councils, the authorities, and the popes? And Luther said, my authority is against them. And they asked, who's that? And Luther said, the Apostle Paul. And he quotes from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. No other foundation can be laid than that which is laid already, Christ Jesus. So this is the rock. So the first principle, therefore, is born, is born out of this struggle. It was a struggle against the authority of the councils and the popes and tra the traditions of the church. Now we are going to go in depth into this principle. This is just a brief passing through here. So you have a handle on this. So this is our first principle, sola scriptura. Now our second principle is, can you guess which one is it? Sola gratia. That's our second principle. Sola gratia. Now this means by grace alone. Now this is in direct opposition to the Catholic system of salvation by faith plus works. Now let, allow me to explain this real quick. When you talk to a Catholic theologian who knows his theology, he will agree with us salvation is by faith. But what they mean is not the same as we understand it to be. Catholic the theology indicates that faith is the radix, that is the root. But that radix must have works. Now, do we understand that? Now, this is placed, this is where it's confusing. This is placed before salvation. So it is a synergistic salvation. That means that it is two at work, two parties. Right? We see the word sin, S-Y-N, comes from synchronized, from the Greek word sin, that means together. When it's together, when it's put together with the word ergos from the Greek means to work. So we have the word synergy. That means two are working together. So Catholic theology places our works before salvation. So they are part of the equation, not part of the result. Okay? So that's, in essence, the difference. So this principle, therefore, sola gratia, or grace alone, is placed over against this understanding, where the reformers said, when they glean from Scripture, for example, we see this very clearly where in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 10. This is a marvelous verse because it lays for us the order of salvation, or the, or the Sebus Salutus. It means the order of salvation. Why? Because the apostle gives us the order of salvation in this verse. What does it say? It says, for you are saved by God's grace. Right? That's the cause. That's the reason. That's what, that's what brings it about. And then the means. He gives us the means. He says, by God's grace, through faith. Right? Those are the means. So you have cause, means. And then it says, this is not of yourselves. 
but it's the gift of God. And then he gives us the reason why is this laid out in this way. Why? So that no man may boast. So the question then is begged. Where are works? Right? Because we also have James on the other side saying that a faith without works is what? Is dead, right? So this is the epistle that the Catholic theologians kept throwing at Luther when he said the salvation was by God's grace alone. They kept throwing that epistle to Luther. And it got so bad that Luther said to one point, he said that James was an epistle of straw. Now, people use that against Luther because, you see, Luther didn't believe in the fallibility and in the sufficiency of Scripture because here what he's saying about James. But Luther wasn't saying that Scripture is insufficient. What he doubted was the canonicity of James. Does that make sense? What he doubted is whether James belonged into the canon or not. Not the, not the inspiration of Scripture, but he doubted to one point later, he reconciled with James because he understood that James was giving us the other side of the same coin. So, coming back to Ephesians. So the question then is asked, where are works? Where are works in the equation? The answer is, works are not in the equation. Because we follow to the next verse. It says, for we are Christ's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That God prepared. Yes? This equation that you're referencing is, is the one that says we become saved. Right? This is the order of salvation, yes. Yeah, you have the cause, which is God's grace, the means, which is faith. The reason is because so that we don't boast about it. And then the works are the result. So they are not part of the equation. They are the result of the equation. So, so this is a why is by grace alone. So we get that, is that clear? I hope so. <laughs> okay, so then the next one, can we guess which one it is? Sola fide. Yes. Right, we got sola Fide. Right, that's faith alone. Right? Now, faith alone comes to us in direct. This is a little bit lengthy, but it's, it's worth it. This is in direct opposition to the sacraments of the church as, as a requirement to be saved. This comes as a, as a direct opposition to the sacraments of the church as requirement to be saved. Remember, under Catholic theology, you need, you need the sacraments of the church in order to be saved. That is, if you do not have, if you are not receiving the sacraments, you are not saved. You cannot be saved according to Catholic canon law. So this is in direct opposition to this. Now we remember the sacraments, right? Seven sacraments for us that who have Catholic backgrounds. We have the sacraments of penance. Right? In, in the penance we have the giving of alms. Pilgrimages, right? We have all these things that we do as an outcome of showing true contrition. Right? So that's the first sacrament, penance. And then we have the Eucharist, or what is known to us as the Lord's Supper. Right? This is embodied into the sacrament, is the center of the Catholic Church, I mean, of the Catholic theology. This is the Eucharist. This is known as the doctrine of transubstantiation. That is where the wine and the bread becomes the literal blood and the literal body of Christ, right? When the priest says those words, says, to thee, unto thee we elevate the true and the living God, that bread and that wine become the blood and body of Christ. <laughs> you were a bad Catholic? 
So we, we, should, we should praise God then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so when the priest elevates the host and says, we offer unto thee the living and the true, the eternal God, in that moment, the miracle, the miracle of transubstantiation takes place. But we remember that when Luther was celebrating his first mass. Right? He tells us in his memoirs that he almost drops the elements because he believed that he was actually holding God in his hands. Right? This was part of the, the Catholic, and it's still to this day, canon law, something that's very interesting. Canon law is infallible. That means that once it's in the canon law, it cannot be reversed. So if you look, if you take the time and have the stamina, look into the canon councils and canon laws, you will find a lot of inconsistencies in the church that had never been resolved. In passing through here, I'll give you one for free. We have Mariology, for example. We have one pope, I think it's uh, 18, 1800s, we have one pope condemning the, the, the immaculate conception of the, of the virgin. That is, condemning that doctrine that says that the virgin was without sin. And then in the, in the past century, in the 20th century, we have another pope in the, 19, in, the 50, in the 1950s affirming the doctrine of the Immaculate Concession of the, of, the, of the Virgin. So we have two infallible popes contradicting one another. So reconcile that for me. That's just a way of passing through here. So the third, the third sacrament is the sacrament of confession. Uh, you, need to, you need to confess your sins to the priest in order to have those sins dealt with. Now we have the sacrament of baptism and then we have the sacrament of marriage. This one of marriage never took off quite clear into the church. Many historians believe that it was more like an addition to try to keep a monopoly into the society as people saw the church to, uh, to uh, perform weddings for them. A lot of Controversies with that one. Now we have the sacrament of the holy orders. Holy orders is when you enter into holy orders, when you became a clergy. This comes from the medieval times because it was believed that the surest road to salvation it was when you became a clergy, when either you became a nun or you became a monk. Uh, Roland Bacon in his uh, biography of Luther tells us that the belief was such that if, when you took holy orders, for example, when you became a monk, it was as a second baptism. This came all the way from Augustine. This came from St. Augustine. And the belief was that when you took holy orders, all your, all your sleigh was wiped clean again. It was like you receive a second infusion of grace because the first one you receive it at baptism according to Catholic theology. That is, when you're baptized as a baby, you receive an infusion, a shot of grace, and that grace keeps you safe until you become accountable and begin to sin away that grace. So that grace diminished, but is replenished by the sacraments. Okay? So, grace diminished as you sin, and is kept and replenished by the sacraments. So this is a system of salvation that worked pretty good in those days, according to canon law. So this also kept a monopoly of the gates of heaven for the church. So this is very important for us to understand. Why? Because we've got to understand that we live in different times. This is before antibiotics were invented. The, the rate of mortality was high. People were more conscientious of their mortality. They thought of death. As Roland Bacon said in his, said in his book, he says, the fires of hell were stoked, not because people did not believe in hell, but to drive the people to the sacraments of the church. So this is, uh, you know, very difficult times. And people were more, uh, in a way, more conscientious of their mortality. Now we have the last sacrament, which is the last rite. Right? That is when a person is on, 
their dead bed, the priest comes and gives them the last rites. This is to ensure they're entering into heaven. Or if they need to go to purgatory, right, there is to assure them that they will be uh, out of purgatory once their time is due. So these are the sacraments of the church. Now, the doctrine of sola fide, as derived from Scripture, stands in direct opposition to this sacraments, to this system that the church had invented. Because, in essence, the doctrine of uh, faith alone, in the final analysis, says this, that man is saved by faith alone. Now, that faith is alone in one person. It is in Christ. In his merit, and all he accomplished by his atonement, his life, his death, and resurrection. So, it's over against that that this faith is placed. So, this, the, the reformers sought to bring back that doctrine Bring, bring it to bear into the conscience into the consciences of man. Can we guess the, the next one? Solus Christus. Yes. <clears throat> and I'm running out of space here. Solus Christos. Solus Christus. Now this is in direct opposition to the Catholic doctrine of Nola Salus Extra Ecclesium. Now what does that mean? That means that outside the Catholic Church, there is no salvation. Now, I want to stress this for a little bit. We must understand that this doctrine still stands to this day. It hasn't gone away. Now, what are the logical implications of this doctrine? If there is no salvation outside the Catholic Church, what does that mean to us? Christ had no, huh? Christ had no purpose. Christ had no purpose. We are doomed. We are outside the camp. Remember in the Old Testament? Right? When you were thrown outside the camp, you were out of fellowship, right? You were out. That's it. Hence we see the references of Christ. To the outer darkness, where is the whipping and gnashing of teeth? That's where we are. We are outside the, the, the camp, according to this doctrine. Now, all the implications of this in those days was that this gave to the church a power over the souls of men. You needed to be under the magisterium of the church. Or you run the risk of being anamatized or excommunicated. That meant your soul was lost forever. Now you got to understand that this is in a time where people really believed in hell. This is serious business. So, solus Christus means Christ alone. Now what does that mean? That means that salvation is found in Christ and that this is what, this is what caused uh, John Huss's life. He says that a man needs to be saved only Christ. He said that salvation can exist. Listen, salvation can exist outside the Catholic Church but not outside Christ. 
So this is set over against that doctrine of the church. Also, this implies Christ as a prominent figure in Scripture. I want to repeat that. This implies that Christ is the prominent figure in Scripture and not merely a means or one piece of the apostle. Now, what is that important? Because in this system, under the Catholic system of salvation, there were many things to play into the system. You had the sacraments of the church. You have the office of the pope, the magisterium of the church. You have the intervention of the saints, the intervention of the Virgin Mary. All these things play, play into your salvation. And Christ is only one of those things. Do we understand that? Under this system, Christ is only one of these things, but not the center. For, for example, we see that with the praying to the Virgin. In fact, in medieval times, again, Roland Bacon tells us in his book that it was believed that Christ had already been the angel to give the sound of the last trumpet. That is, Christ had already given the order to the angel to blow the last trumpet when the virgin ran to his feet and implored Christ and pleaded with him and said, Son, my brothers, the monks are not ready. So Christ reprieved. He gave more time because the, mayor, uh, the virgin interceded because she is full of grace. So, Solus Christus implies, no, Christ is not just a means or part of the apostle, part of the system. He is everything. He is everything. He is imminent in scripture. He is preeminent. Right? That, that phraseology comes from Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. When the apostle tells us that he is in the image of the invisible God, and he is the firstborn over all creation. That's the, the Greek word prototokos, means the preeminent one. It's not a chronological statement. It is a positional statement. That's who he is. We see that also in John chapter 5. You remember, if you remember in the context of that passage, what started the problem? If you read in the beginning of the passage, John 5, you will see that Christ healed a lame man by the pool of Bethesda. And they asked, who healed you? It's the Sabbath. You shouldn't pick up your mat. And they were upset because he had broken their interpretations of the Sabbath. And Christ answered to them and said, oh, I do only as I see the Father doing. And it says in the text very clearly that since then they began to persecute him because he made himself equal with God. And when they began to argue and ask him what kind of authority he had, he replies, if you go further to verse 39, he said this, you, he says, actually verse 37, he says, you do not believe the one who sent me. You don't have his word abiding in you because you do, not, you do not believe in me. And then he says this. You study the scriptures diligently because you believe that in the scriptures you have eternal life. But what does it say? But they are those who give testimony about me. Right. What is Christ doing? What is our Lord saying in that passage? He's claiming preeminence. He's, claim, he's claiming centrality over scripture. His centrality. He say, he's saying scriptures are about me. Solus Christus. Solus Christus. Also we have another reference in Colossians 3.11. Where... The apostle says that there is no Greek, no Scythian, no slave, but Christ is all in all. 
Again, that's the centrality of Christ. So, solus Christus means then, in Christ is salvation alone, and he is the central piece. There's nothing else. That's over against the doctrine of the church of Nola Salum's extra eclipse, eclipse, which means outside the Catholic church there is no salvation. So what you understand what the church did there is it placed itself between men and Christ. So it pushed Christ further from the people. Right? This is, uh, for us, this is plainly understood. If you look upon some, some medieval paintings, for example, the, look, Google the painting that it says the day of judgment. You will see there the Christ is painted above the rainbow with the lily coming out of his right ear, left ear, and the sword coming out of his right ear. He was presented, and then on the bottom we see the, the demons dragging people from the tombs to hell, and then we see the angels usher the saints to heaven. And even then, in that ladder up to heaven, we see the demons trying to get the saints off the ladder. But Christ is presented as this relentless, in, unapproachable judge. And only the church could usher you to him. You cannot approach Christ directly. So the reformers saw the necessity of bringing the, the, the testimony of Scripture again to bear in the minds and conscience of men so the men did not see Christ as this relentless judge and this implacable judge, an approachable judge like Martin Luther said. But they sought to bring Christ as presented by Scripture into the minds and consciences of men as the only way and who was approachable. So, hence his birth, this doctrine of Solus Christus. Now, the last one is the over, overarching theme in Scripture. You got all this? Now, this is what theologians call Greek word, Greek alert, <laughs> the thelos, the thelos, H, as the thelos. The thelos means the purpose. The purpose. Now, the purpose is what Johann Sebastian Bach used to put in his in his uh, compositions. Soli Deo. Holy Deo Gloria. That is for the glory of God alone. Now, this is in direct opposition to the elevation of the office of the Pope and the usurping of the title of the Vicar of Christ. Why do I say that? You have heard that the Pope is called the Vicar of Christ on earth. Now, what does that mean? The Vicar means one who is in place, in place of. Now, who is the true Vicar of Christ? Huh? Christ. Well, yes, Christ, but who is in, in place of Christ on the earth right now at work? Hmm? The Holy Spirit. I will see that in John 14. 15 and 16. He is the parakletos, the one who comes with power. He said, Christ said of him, he will come 
and he will reveal to you all truth, although he will not speak of his own, but for, from what is mine he will give unto you. He is the true vicar of Christ, not the Pope. The Holy Spirit is. Right, so, again, this theme of sola, soli deo gloria is the overarching theme in Scripture. Why? Because, you see, the whole of humanity, the whole of humanity, the whole of history, every single thing in creation is to and for the glory of God. As the, many of our confessions tell us, what is the chief end of man? To glorify God, to enjoy Him forever. That is it. Like Paul tells us in first, uh, what is it? Uh, first Corinthians. Mm -hmm. That is it. To to God's glory. Now, when we get to this, this is just a brief overview, if you can call it brief. <laughs> uh, we'll go into detail into what this means. Because undergirded into this, it goes other very important principle that is the gateway for us to obtain this purpose, and that is the holiness of God. If the holiness of God is neglected, as we pursue to glorify God, our purpose is truncated because we will never be able to glorify God in the measurement that we neglect to keep and preserve His holiness. Do, do we understand that? If our methods and if our practices defile the holiness of God, we cannot attain to glorify Him. Do we understand that? We can. So, we are going to stop here, and that is the introduction to the five solas of the Reformation.